Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Costelli. I'm the Chief Development Officer with Amicus Therapeutics, and I'm very pleased to be here at the meeting on the Med. Uh, so Amicus is a global patient-dedicated biotechnology company focused on discovering, developing, and delivering high-quality medicines for people living with rare metabolic and neuromuscular diseases. We are headquartered in the United States. Uh, however, we have an international headquarters in the UK and have employees in 27 countries around the world. We have one marketed product, a uh, small molecule chaperone Gallifold in Fabry disease. We have another product that just completed phase three trials, ATJA and ERT combined with a small molecule stabilizer for Pompeii disease. And we have two intrathecal AD gene therapies in the clinic for different subtypes of Batten disease. And finally, we have a robust discovery engine through our collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania and have a number of gene therapies in discovery and preclinical development. This slide shows a snapshot of Gallifold. Uh, it's an oral small molecule pharmacological chaperone. It's a precision medicine uh, indicated for Fabry patients with certain types of mutations that are amenable to Gallifold's mechanism of action. We currently have over 1,300 different amenable mutations included in the European label. And last year we did $261 million in revenue. And this year we're guiding to 300 to $315 million in revenue. Moving on now to our ATGAA product. Uh, this slide shows a snapshot of that, which we just finished our phase three study. Uh, ATGA consists of um, a recombinant human GA enzyme that's engineered for targeting an uptake. That's ATB200. And that is combined with a small molecule stabilizer called AT2221. AT2221 is administered just prior to the infusion and the intention of that is to stabilize the enzyme in the circulation. Last month, uh, we reported top line results from our phase three study, Propel, comparing ATJA to approved therapy. Uh, this was one of the largest randomized studies ever conducted in the lysosomal storage diseases. And this study demonstrated improvement in various functional outcomes in late onset pump aid patients, particularly those who had been on approved therapy and then switched over to ATJA. And we're on track to submit the last module of our BLA in the second quarter this year, followed by additional global submissions uh, in the second half of the year. Moving on now to our gene therapy business. Um, so this slide shows the evolution of Amicus R&D. We started with the pharmacological chaperones. These were small molecules intended to stabilize naturally produced enzymes in the body. We then started to work on next generation enzyme replacement therapies that were stabilized and targeted where we were taking recombinant enzymes engineered outside the body and using our technologies to stabilize and target them. We took that expertise and leveraged it towards next generation gene therapies and working how we can use protein engineering to both stabilize and target the actual transgenes to make more potent um, transgenes for, for AED gene therapies. So this slide uh, summarizes our gene therapy business. It starts with our Gene Therapy Center of Excellence in Philadelphia. Um, we have three industry leading collaborations with the University of Pennsylvania, Nationwide Children's Hospital and the Sanford Research Center. We have nine active clinical and preclinical gene therapy programs. And that's across uh, 50 potential disease areas that we're interested in working on. And of course, this is all driven by our 70 plus dedicated scientists in our gene therapy. Uh, research. This slide shows uh, the Amicus portfolio. In addition to Gallifold and ATGA, we also have next generation gene therapies uh, in development for Fabry and Pompeii that build upon our deep disease expertise as well as leverage the Amicus pen discovery engine. We also have a franchise of Batten disease gene therapies uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about. And then we have a number of different next generation gene therapies with a CNS focus uh, across MPS3A, MPS3B, CDKL5 deficiency, and Angelman syndrome. So I'll start here on Batten disease and provide you a high level overview of our two clinical stage gene therapy programs. Uh, collectively, Batten disease 
is one of the most common neurodegenerative diseases affecting children. Uh, there's various different subtypes, all caused by a loss of function and a CLN mutation that ends up in uh, neuronal lysosomal dysfunction. All forms lead to neurodegeneration and rapid loss of a child's ability to walk, speak, think, see, and ultimately result in early uh, mortality. There's no approved therapies um, and there's an urgent need for treatment. And the two programs we have here were uh, actually based upon work that was started uh, by a nationwide children's hospital. This slide shows a schematic of our ATGTX501 study in CLN6 Batten disease. This is an intrathecally delivered AAV gene therapy by lumbar puncture that leverages the wild type CLN6 trans gene. Uh, we've enrolled 13 subjects in this study and have now followed a majority out to two years post gene transfer. Uh, the key efficacy assessment here is the Hamburg Motor and Language Score. And on this slide, we show some of that uh, data that we just presented recently for the first eight kids uh, that had reached that two months of follow up. Um, on the left here, in, uh, you can see in blue is a representation of those gene therapy treated kids showing the change from baseline over that two years of follow-up. And as you can see here, the majority of kids on gene therapy were either stable or only had a one point decline over that two years. Whereas those patients in red from a, a natural history cohort of CLN6 kids, you can see the majority of those kids had two year decline over that two year follow-up. And on the right is that same data, but in more of a traditional Kaplan-Meier plot where you can see uh, the, the much rapid, more rapid decline in those untreated kids towards that two point decline in motor and language function. This slide now shows a schematic of our ATGTX502 clinical study, and this is for CLN3 Batten disease. Um, it's a very similar program to CLN6. Uh, it's also intrathecally delivered AAV via lumbar puncture with the wild type CLN3 transgene. Here we've enrolled four subjects, three at a low dose, one at a high dose. The key efficacy assessment is the unified Batten disease rating scale, the physical domain. Um, and the main clinical difference between CLN6 and CLN3 is that here, CLN3 is a little bit later onset, more of a juvenile onset, and is a slightly slower disease progression, but still uh, very progressive and, and fatal. This data now shows uh, the, the first set of data for those first three kids in the low dose cohort uh, that were followed now for the first year post gene transfer. And as you can see in the figure on the right, those gene therapy treated patients uh, represented in blue have been stable from their baseline. And as you can see in yellow, the expected trajectory is a, is a much more rapid uh, in, increase in the scale or worsening uh, about three points per year, whereas the patients that we treated with the gene therapy stayed very, very stable. So this is really encouraging initial results across both our CLN6 and CLN3 programs. Uh, we're actively working on the manufacturing and all the clinical development and regulatory discussions to move these uh, into the next clinical studies, the registration focused studies for both programs that we're looking to initiate here in the second half of 2021. I'll move on now to our discovery engine that we have through our collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania and the gene therapy program. Uh, this next generation platform combines amicus protein engineering uh, expertise and that rare disease development experience we have with the University of Pennsylvania's expertise in AV capsid safety, immunology, and clinical translation. Uh, to discover and develop potential best-in-class AAV gene therapies across uh, 50 different rare diseases that we're initially targeting. This schematic shows how Amicus really looks to um, use our protein engineering to develop next-generation transgenes that are optimized for cross-correction. So first we look for novel untranslated sequences to increase expression, effective signal sequences to increase protein secretion. And then we look at the protein target itself and look to see if there are ways to engineer improved stability when that protein is in the blood or in the CSF. And also if there's ways to add targeting moieties so that when that protein is in the blood or CSF, it can effectively be taken up back into neighboring cells. 
This slide shows uh, our preclinical proof of concept data for our Pompeii A, the IND candidate uh, that combines an amicus engineered transgene for improved targeting in this case, combined with a ubiquitous proprietary pen capsid and promoter. Um, and what you can see on this slide is in the top left panel that shows that this engineered transgene has better binding to the target cell receptor for uptake. And in the mouse study on the right, we're showing with histology data that we see much better glycogen clearance with that engineered amicus transgene represented in the third panel compared to the wild type transgene in that second panel. These are with the same AAV capsid, the same dose. The only difference here is whether it's the amicus engineered transgene for targeting versus the wild type GA transgene. And you can see that both in the muscle as well as in the spinal cord, we're seeing much better substrate clearance and basically potency with that amicus engineered transgene. This slide now shows our preclinical proof of concept data for our Fabre AAV IND candidate. In this case, it's an amicus engineered transgene for stability, again, combined with a pen capsid that's uh, ubiquitous and, uh, and also a ubiquitous promoter. In this case, we've actually engineered that dimer interface of the GLA uh, protein to engineer instability. In the bottom left-hand panel, you can see that at neutral pH in blue, that engineered protein is much more stable and able to remain active while it's in the blood. And what that translates to in that middle panel on the bottom is better substrate reduction across different dose ranges than again, the wild type transgene, again, in the same capsid, same promoter, same study. Importantly here in the low and the medium doses, the first two blue bars, we see really good substrate reduction equivalent to what was seen with the high dose of the wild type transgene. And we think that will allow us to successfully translate this into the clinic where we know we're gonna see less expression as we get into primates and humans than we do in the mice. And also in the study, we, we were really excited to see the first evidence that we're aware of, of uh, substrate reduction in the dorsal root ganglia cells in the Fabre model. And we think that this could have important implications potentially for the, the Fabre neuropathy that is seen. On this slide, we show uh, another proof of concept in animals that we just generated. In this case, it's for CLN1 batten disease. Um, we leverage the same targeting technology that we did for our Pompeii AAV gene therapy, but here applied it towards that CLN1 uh, protein and transgene. And again, we were able to show that that amicus engineered transgene uh, had more potency, and in this case was better able to prevent the accumulated storage material that we see in the thalamus accumulating in the CLN1 knockout mice. And that is represented here in the two bars on the far right, the dark blue and the darker blue, are two different engineered constructs, again, in the same capsids. I and mean, you can see that there's more potency with that amicus engineered transgene. We also recently announced the initiation of a discovery program in Angelman disease, uh, where we're looking to develop a one-time AAV gene therapy to restore UBE3 activity through both direct transduction, but also importantly through potential cross-correction, trying to leverage the Ambicus protein engineering and pen vector technologies. Uh, we're very excited at the potential synergies of the Ambicus and pen approaches to apply them towards Angelman here to try to go uh, about gene therapy in a slightly different way than, than we've seen others take. On this slide, you can see the key milestones and takeaways uh, for our gene therapy business, um, really focused on next clinical studies in CLN6 and CLN3 Batten, um, really working to get the manufacturing and all the clinical and regulatory work to start up those registration studies later this year, uh, progressing the manufacturing and IND enabling work for the Fabre and Pompe gene therapy programs, and then uh, we have active ongoing studies uh, in various different uh, amicus engineered uh, gene therapies combined with pen proprietary capsids in MPS3A, MPS3B, CDKL5. And we're excited to see uh, data this year coming out from, from all those different programs. Um, and of course, additional foundational work that both PAN and amicus are working on across gene therapy technologies. And finally, I would just like to close by noting that Amicus is positioned to accomplish all of our core strategic 
uh, initiatives, including growing Gallifold, advancing ATGA to global approvals and launch, uh, advancing multiple gene therapies into and through the clinic. Uh, and we can do all of that while achieving self-sustainability without the need for future financings. And with that, I would like to thank you and hope that you have a great cell and gene meeting on the NESA.